Hello, and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Careers. My name is Claudia Malad, and on today's episode, we have Ashish Singhal. We'll discuss his path to entrepreneurship, his connections between quality assurance and regulatory affairs, and career options for food science and biotechnology graduates. I hope you enjoy. Hi, Ashish. Welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Careers. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, so this is, as we know, an informational interview. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and we'll just kind of have a chat about your career journey, your career history. So with that being said, can I get you to introduce yourself for the audience and something that you are passionate about? Yeah, thanks. So uh, obviously, my name is Ashish, as you would know. Um, I'm teaching a course at Conestoga. It's a quality assurance and regulatory affairs foundation. And I also have my own consulting firm. So we do the same thing. We provide quality assurance and regulatory services, licensing uh, to different sort of clients, whether in cannabis, natural health products and others. If I have to say one thing I'm passionate about, I think I'm passionate about being good. You know, like I always try to find in my whole life what I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. But I think rather than trying to one thing which I'm passionate about, I try to do things very well. Not trying to be perfect, but do the best of my understanding. Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. that's what I would say my passion is. I love that. Mastering a skill would be exactly. your passion. That's yeah, great. That's what, that's what I would say. Because sometimes, uh, for some people, I think it's easy to say that this is what I'm passionate about. But that never come to me. Mm -hmm. It's for some reason. So I, I kind of try to master a skill. Absolutely. That sounds great. Can you tell me a little bit about your first job, your first employment experience? Uh, my first job was when I completed my master's. Uh, so I did my master's from U of S in Saskatchewan. So I stayed in Saskatchewan for almost eight years. Mm -hmm. And after that, I did my first job that was a quality assurance and lab tech. And I was very excited to get that job. And the experience was interesting because that was a contract job, you know, and when you are an immigrant here in Canada, mm -hmm. having a six month job and then that will turn into a full time, that kind of adds a time bomb pressure on you. Correct? Mm -hmm. So it was interesting. I loved it. I enjoyed it. And at some point, you know, I thought I'm going to settle in this small town. Thankfully, it didn't happen. <laughs> and uh, it was it was all right. I got a lot of experience. Uh, my boss was nice. And my job was a little bit about, you know, canola oil, correct? So you have to consume canola oil. Okay. And I will, what, what I will do is I will test the canola oil for all the required testing before it come to the consumer. Okay. Even we will flavor test it. You oh, wouldn't wow. believe it. Like I will take canola oil, put it in my mouth, check the flavor and spit it out. And just oh. to make sure that the consumer is getting the right flavor of the product. So that was interesting. So that was my first job. Wow. Testing canola oil. Yeah. Actually tasting it yourself to ensure the product was That's right. actually one of the tests. It's ah. called the flavor test. Okay. So, you know, like uh, when, when, when the canola oil is made, it's quite fresh. Okay. So it's really fresh. And when you taste it, it will taste really buttery. Okay. So you have to flavor kind of based on that and do a flavor profile. Wow. Just to, yeah, it's interesting. Actually. Yeah. I would have never thought that it's actually taste tested before it gets yeah. to the consumer. Yeah, that's amazing. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about your educational background. You said you did your master's in Saskatchewan, but what did you study? So I did a master's in food sciences. And before that, I did a bachelor's in biotechnology. So bachelor's in biotechnology, I did back in India. Okay. Uh, and how does it work there is like you have an engineering degree as a biotechnology, which is not so common in Canada. Mm -hmm. In Canada, I don't think I've come across an engineering degree, which is associated with biotechnology. Okay. Like you have an engineering discipline, but maybe with mechanical engineering and other engineering disciplines. So I did my bachelor's from there. And then I moved to uh, do my master's in food sciences. And that was an interesting story. Uh, I had few options to come, but I chose to come to Canada for two reasons. First of all, it's a great country to come in, mm -hmm. correct? Because multi-diversity and everything. And they were, rather than going to U.S. at that point of time, I wanted to come to Canada. Mm -hmm. And second, my education here was funded. Okay. So it was uh, obviously a big boost for me to come here. Right. So yeah, I decided to come and do my master's there. Okay, awesome. Can you tell me a little bit more about what biotechnology means? Biotechnology means as like you are utilizing technological tools, including any information with the biological principles, and you are making certain products which could be utilized for individuals. For instance, your vaccines. 
Okay. okay. Your vaccines are developed using a bacteria. Yep. Okay. So we, we, I, I do not remember exactly, but I think it's recombinant bacteria. So we, we modify the bacteria to develop certain thing, which you want to use it for consumer. And in this case, it's insulin also. Okay. okay. So biotechnology, what it is doing is it is utilizing different biological principles and combining technology to produce products for consumers and to betterment of the mankind. Okay. okay so fermentation could also be an example okay. of biotechnology. That's great. And quality assurance is a very large industry. So can you be a little bit more specific and tell us what does quality assurance mean? Quality assurance means is uh, you are making sure that any product going out into the market, it could be any product, even your cars, mm -hmm. okay, a airplane, Boeing, or food product, mm -hmm. anything, that when you is reaching to the consumer, that you the consumer has the satisfaction that the product has been properly produced, tested, packaged, labeled, and meeting all the requirements of the particular regulation. Okay. So what quality assurance is doing in this role is any step during the process of those packaging, labeling, production, they are making sure that it is meeting those certain standards of uh, certain set of standards and specification. Okay. Okay. So for instance, um, let's say uh, if there is a, I'm trying to pick an example. Uh, let's say your milk. Okay. Okay. You're getting milk. You go to a store and you buy the milk. Okay. Now, how does that milk survive for so many days? Correct. It's yeah. you have certain shelf life on it. Yeah. So, would it survive the same way as fresh milk? No. Absolutely so what they not. do is they have a specialization technique where they heat the milk to a certain temperature, kill everything, bacteria right. in it, so it survives. Correct. Right. Now, what's the quality assurance role is going to be that that particular procedure is done as per the standard operating procedure, the limits are in proper compliance. For instance, if there is certain temperature and pressure, that it's done according to that temperature and pressure. If you have to record it, it's done recording properly. And then they have to defend that, all that information against the auditor. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's quite a process. <laughs> it's quite a process. Yeah. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, it hasn't got so much attention because it directly does not bring money. Right. It's like an insurance. Yep. Okay, so you don't want to pay for insurance until something bad happens. Of course. <laughs> Got yeah, it? yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. So your biotechnology degree, as well as your food science degree, kind of marry those two things that we kind of just discussed. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit more about why you chose to get into this field? Uh, so yeah, biotechnology I chose because it was a very uh, interesting field. It is still a very interesting field because you're learning about a lot of different technologies. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, without going into detail, but it's like food biotechnology, enzymology, uh, genetic engineering, all of these important principles come on with biotechnology. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, I did food sciences because food sciences, I cannot learn everything in very detail with biotech. Okay, biotech is a jack of all trades. Yeah. So then I uh, decided to go into food sciences because that was a little bit more interesting point to me, like to learn. And I learned a lot about different things in the food sciences I was learning about it and I find it interesting and somehow I tied it to being myself as a foodie for some reason <laughs> so I <laughs> said works. okay yeah, yeah let's do food sciences mm -hmm. then I did my food sciences uh, and I applied for it uh, and how these two tied together if uh, they're a little bit two different fields but how does it tie together is biotechnology is a lot about production okay okay you're producing things well, quality assurance is when you have produced it, what you're making sure that it's produced properly. Right. So uh, I also wanted to go in product development side of it. Uh, and there were two fields. Either you go product development or foods or quality assurance. Uh, so product development, I learned a lot, a little bit during my master's thesis project. Mm -hmm. And then I also wanted to start on the quality assurance side of it. And if someone has to go into quality assurance, like let's say you do not need tons of educational qualifications to go into quality assurance. Uh, if you're doing any diploma related courses around it, like you do a food sciences, even a regulatory affair, so you're doing a degree, that's fine too. Um, and your first job might be a little bit challenging, but taking some certification courses, even taking certifications courses like HACCP, okay. um, or taking certifications courses like food safety certification courses, food quality auditor courses, 
that might get you some foot in the door. Would uh, you have to have a science background, though, to take that, d- that HACCP certificate? I would say some knowledge is required. Okay. But I don't think any certification is specifically asked to ask you to have a science background. Okay. So the, the barrier to entry requirement is not so high uh, to get into a quality assurance role. Unless you want to go into a regulatory affairs role. Okay. Uh, that's where you need to actually learn more things uh, because then you're directly dealing with government organizations. Yeah. Uh, so part of my role is quality assurance, the name attaches to it, but also is dealing with the government organizations, licensing applications, and then defending your government orders. So that's where you need to have those regulatory understanding. Okay. Yeah. So you can start with quality assurance, then learn about regulations. Uh, that would be a easier way to start it. But you can also directly go into regulatory affairs and bypass quality assurance. It really depends on uh, what the individual want to do. Right, right. But would you say having a quality assurance background helps with the regulatory affairs? Definitely. Okay. Because uh, if you just have regulatory affairs, you still have to prepare an application package to submit. Right. And you it would be difficult for you to understand what this document says. It's like a business analyst. Then you become like a business analyst. You're just going back and forth. Yeah. So having those actual understanding of documentation will save time and communication and efforts. It's like the foundation to kind of learn. I would say yes, definitely. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And your experience coming to Canada, you know, from India, how was that transition for you? Um, it was a bittersweet, you know, because, uh, I did live a little bit further from my place in India itself to do my bachelor's. Okay. It was not my hometown. So we were already thinking that my parents were already thinking like, I'm going to come back, you know, and settle with them. And I wanted to, uh, but there was not so many opportunities in my area. So the transition, uh, as in when I got it, when I got in Canada, I was happy and when I settled in here, it was taking some time, you know, like there was this homesickness feeling and everything. But there was also excitement. You're coming to a new country and not being traveled to anywhere before outside of India. Mm-hmm. It was also interesting, you know, like it was exciting how, how different people are there, how the things look like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as the time gets settled, um, I would say that excitement also turned into maturity. Mm-hmm. You know, like many people, when they come, they have this cultural shock. Yeah. Some people take it lightly. Some people take it heavily. So I think with time, it kind of got settled. And uh, that's how I'm sitting. (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. One thing I I like to ask people that, you know, come from other countries in the world. How was your first Canadian winter? Because you were in Saskatchewan. So it's cold up there. I fell a lot. Oh, no. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, it's so funny. Like I'm walking. I had all my winter shoes. Yeah. Still, I would fall. And it was like. You, you're walking yeah. and there's black ice and you fall. Yeah. And then you're suddenly realizing, okay, let's wake up and go. But uh, overall, I love the winter and I will tell you why. Uh, the part I come from India, we crave for snow. Okay. okay. Like you go to places to see snow. Okay. So when I was coming here and I wanted to see snow, so I was very happy. But then there were people who will tell, well, wait till your first snow and then we'll yeah. see how yeah. you like it. <laughs> but it was interesting. I remember my first snow looking around the, uh, looking outside the window and... Uh, uh, it was a very good experience. Yeah. I didn't enjoy, obviously, the wind chill. Of course. Because that's like minus 30, minus 40. Yeah. Um, but I think with time, my tolerance of winter also increased. Of course. The longer you're in it, the more you get used exactly. to it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So switching gears now, let's talk a little bit more about your career journey. So we know your first job was, you know, being like a food tester, quality assurance type mm-hmm. role. What was your, I guess, next job to lead you where you are today? My next job? Yeah. So after you did the um, quality assurance position, what was your career journey from there? So I did a few jobs like that. Okay. So there was another quality assurance lab tech for one of the another company I work. What we used to do there is produce uh, wheat flour. Okay. Okay. Uh, We had organic and conventional products. What does it mean is, you know, like if you go to a shelf, you have regular products and you have organic products. Yep. So what I learned in those jobs is um, that regardless what kind of company you're working in or what product they're producing in, but there are different certifications associated with it. And you have to learn about different those of certifications. So in that job, 
the second job, which was with, uh, I think if I remember the name, the company was Nutrison Foods. Okay. Um, and what I learned there is it was a smaller company, um, smaller than my first company. What I learned there is uh, that I could develop more things without having more authority. Okay. okay. So I was not, I was not a manager. Obviously, I was starting my career, but they embraced my curiosity. So I would develop their GMP plans. I will do more training sessions with the people. And uh, they kind of liked it, you know, okay. like they, it could go both ways. Uh, I would say in my first company, they were like, you know, you do whatever you're doing and you're happy, be right. happy. While in my second job, what I noticed is like they were craving for more improvement. Okay. Okay. So regardless of your authority or anything. So that was a, a very good experience for me because I developed programs there and that boosted your confidence. Okay. Because those programs was never developed before. My manager liked it, he loved it, and we implemented it. So that's where my confidence also significantly grew and also my desire to grow. Okay. And I'm a non-food science person by any means. That's so fine. can you tell me what are G GMP plans? What are those? Yeah. So um, it's good manufacturing practices. Okay. Okay. So yeah, like let's say there is also GLP, like good laboratory practices. Okay. So good manufacturing practices is if you're producing anything, you follow certain principles. Right. Okay. So one of the principles could be sanitation. Okay. You want to make sure that your area where you're producing the food, your equipment, everything is clean and sanitized before you put any raw material there. Right. So that's one of the things. You want to make sure that you do not have, you have proper pest control practices. Of course. You want to make sure that the, for instance, a very good example is if you're buying a Lay's package, a chips packet, I and mean, if it says 50 gram in it, would you like to get 45 grams in it? Absolutely not. Correct? <laughs> so, and how do we make sure is we are going to weigh it on a scale which is calibrated. Okay. And we are going to have calibration records. So those are all part of GMP. Right, and right. to comply with it. So you got a lot of that independence and freedom to develop those things at that secondary job that you had. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the secondary job was there and I also worked as a processing supervisor uh, for a meat plant. Okay. And that was a very different job than what I was doing. And uh, it was a whole different, <laughs> interesting role. Mm -hmm. What I did there, I could never go back to that job. <laughs> But what I learned from there was right. another different kind of skill set, which I still apply. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you had all these jobs, you have your master's. How do we get to where we are today? So, you know, you have your own consulting company and I know you teach at Conestoga College. So let's talk about how you transitioned to becoming um, your own boss, self-employed. Um, yeah. And it's interesting. Um, so the one of the company I was working with before I switched to my consulting firm. Uh, so that was the transition. I moved from Saskatchewan to Ontario. Okay. okay. So Saskatchewan, I was working for this great company uh, and I was working, uh, I was developing their whole quality management system from scratch. Okay. So developing all SOPs and everything. But then I also wanted to grow, which I was not getting that growth. Right. And then I decided, okay, we have to grow somewhere. And then this company in Ontario hired me. That was good pay, significantly more pay, significantly better title and everything. When I moved here, what I decided, what I learned here is that there was still a lot of knowledge gap. Okay. And the company had a lot of consultants in this the company I was working with. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was like kind of tingling in my head. Okay, shall I be doing the same thing? Maybe. Absolutely. Correct. So, um, so there was that thought. And at the same time, um, the, there was some challenging conditions to work in. Mm -hmm. So after some time, we decided to switch. And uh, the switch came suddenly. Okay, suddenly I want to make that switch because otherwise you just sink in your comfort zone there. So then I made that switch. Uh, first month was terrible. Okay, like as you could see, like I'm just on my bed and trying to figure out what to do, what to do next. Right. And can you tell me a little bit more about your business? So what does your business do? So my business is associated with quality and regulatory uh, affairs services. Okay. What does it mean is like, it sounds like a broader term, but what we do is we provide any sort of SOP writing, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, licensing applications. Uh, if you require uh, gap assessments for your company, let's say if you think that there's some issue with the company, we come with a fixed checklist to your site. We go, okay, do you have this? Do you have this? And then we do a gap assessment report. Okay. Uh, so we do this for cannabis, natural health products, dietary supplements, and other related areas. So that's where, uh, and also food industry. Mm -hmm. So we provide a whole pack of services depending on what are the client requirements, and we fulfill those uh, needs. 
And one of the service, as I mentioned earlier, is the fractional QAP. Yes. Uh, that's one of the service uh, specifically for the cannabis clients because that's the requirement of the uh, Health Canada. Okay. So when you made the transition, did you quit your job entirely to now focus solely on being a consultant? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that was the plan because uh, there was no sweet spot kind, kind right. of thing. Correct. Like I'm not going to tell the company, you know, this is what happened or whatever. Right. So yeah, the job uh, got quit. Then basically moved to this uh, consulting firm. I started designing my logo and everything, sending my logos to my um, uh, friends. Um, and there were some people who I talked to during this period who kind of also helped in a way because I kind of asked them, oh, how did you design your logo? How did you do your incorporation? Shall right. I do my incorporation or shall I do my self-employment? How shall I move forward? Yeah. So uh, that, that, those small steps came forward. Uh, and what I realized is as I was moving forward, there were a lot of industry contacts who I, when I was working, indirectly we had some good connections and they okay. were recommending few people to me right so and so that's still working a lot of it is word of mouth right uh, yeah so fast forward that's how it has started so would you say networking was a big piece of establishing and starting your business so i will tell you one thing so far and i don't have tons of like 100 years of experience in consulting what mm -hmm. i will tell you is networking is one key point but you have to make sure the people you are interacting with is you are genuine yourself. Okay? Right. And the reason is uh, uh, many of the times, you know, when someone is going to ask that person, do you know anyone who you can trust? Right. Okay. So regardless how much you have networked to them, if they don't remember you or you haven't made an impact with your genuinity, they will not recommend you. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened with me. Uh, some of the people... I have been recommended by, I could never think they would recommend me. Right. Yeah. So in fact, and that's true. While some, yes, I have some idea, okay, they will recommend me, but some I will, I cannot even think of it. Mm. So I say the networking is important, but what is important is that you keep all of your interactions genuine. Uh, sell, obviously you're there to sell in consulting, but yeah. don't oversell. Right. And if you're genuine, then things will work out eventually. Yeah. So that's a good tip though. So networking, make sure you're your genuine self when you're interacting and engaging with other individuals because you never know what, where that could possibly lead. Yeah. And, and if you like someone, correct? Let's say yeah. if, you, if you're meeting someone and you like that person's personality, personality okay. in the sense you like that, like some, I like some people who have calm leadership style, style rather than a loud leadership style. Of course. Okay. Of course. So if, if I like that, I tell that person, you know, I like your leadership style, that's calm leadership style. And I think I've seen those people like they do more without speaking a lot of things. Correct? Right. And right. Um, it's a simple, you know, like that person liked it. Maybe that person will recommend you. <laughs> so, exactly. And you person, never know. Yeah. Right. So those kind of things. Don't be shy to appreciate if you like it mm -hmm. in someone. Mm hmm. No, that makes sense. Um, so I'm guessing in your industry, especially being a business owner, mentorship was kind of important as well. What are your thoughts on mentorship? Yeah, I think mentorship is very important, uh, but it's also very hard to find a mentor. Mm -hmm. I, I had actually a lot of trouble finding a mentor. Okay. I still want a mentor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, tell you, so I'm still looking for one if yep. you find one. Okay. Um, but uh, you should always embrace if, uh, if someone is coming and showing some passion and dedication to be your mentor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even uh, teaching at Kurostoga, I kind of appreciate if someone is coming with a resume. Yes. Okay. So if they come and they tell me, okay, can you tell me or give me some advice, uh, which program to choose, what to do? I tell them, you know, like send me a resume, I will take a look. But I also I tell them, you know, like you have to make sure that you're giving your best shot. Like, don't mm -hmm. send me a piece of paper which has nothing on it. Right. Okay, so I tell them, do your best shot, send it to me, and if nothing works out, I will tell you what to improve, and I do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so I think that kind of mentorship is very important. Um, and, and down the line, in my understanding, if you have clear idea what you want to be, start looking for mentor very early. Okay. Don't wait until you're transitioning your career, because that is something... Uh, but you need to have a clear vision for it, correct? You need to know, okay, I'm going to build this. I'm going to have that. I'm going to have 10 clients. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have this. So maybe find someone who has already done it. Right. It's going to be challenging to find that person, but there are other 
things you can reach out you can go on linkedin okay you can send a text message on sorry you can send a message on linkedin you can reach out you can ask a uh, little bit personalized message okay i like your publication i like your this can you please guide me how i can do this and you will be surprised that people are busy but maybe after 10 days they will reply mm-hmm. you can always follow up after 15 days okay so don't be shy and don't and this is what i did i did a little bit of overthinking shall i reach out to that guy shall i is it too early yeah okay but in this fast busy world no one has time right correct so maybe reach out to them after 15 days okay. after 3 weeks put a timer on yourself so other person doesn't have time to think oh you have reached out to them three times yeah okay so yeah. But, yeah not like every day yeah of, of course <laughs> of course yeah so mentorship super important reaching out to people on linkedin and following up within a reasonable time and then also of course presenting your genuine self i think is the key message there exactly yeah those are the few things i would uh, corroborate on it and utilize linkedin a lot okay linkedin is a very good resource to make Uh, I would say semi-formal contact. Okay. Because people are not too formal and people are not too professional. Right. Okay. And I would also advise for new students who do not have a lot of experience and it always come, you know, how do we get a first job? We do not have a lot of experience. What you can do is you can start, you can start posting some content. For instance, you learned something in class. You can put your thoughts out it. Mm-hmm. You can say that this is a great example of this and this is what I learned from it. put it down on linkedin okay not not like an advertisement or something of course uh and that will also get attraction from recruiters absolutely that will get you more follower followers genuine followers that will increase your network mm-hmm. so linkedin is a very great resource actually in this today's world absolutely um you mentioned earlier a little bit about when you started your business it was a little bit challenging so can you talk a little bit more about the challenges to start a brand new business and how did you overcome them um i still have those challenges <laughs> so uh, one of the one of the main challenges um first not having that you're not going to get a client okay okay so i'm in a consulting business so obviously our business is uh, all client based yep so first challenge is when you're starting brand new is that you're not going to get a client and that fear is quite big because you never had a client right. correct so that is going to be the most challenging part is to convince yourself that sooner or later you're going to have one client right you just have to keep building momentum in the meantime so you're not thinking on that my challenge my thing was that i was posting a lot of linkedin content okay okay so i had knowledge i had understanding of regulations and everything what i was doing is i will make some articles like uh, for instance to give you recalls correct like someone get recalled from the market yep. i will write an article on recall and how it impact cannabis industry okay or what are the common causes of recall what you can do and all that kind of thing so i will post out those articles there will be some traction going i will reach out to my contacts i knew mm-hmm. uh and my wife was a very big support obviously you know mm-hmm. like she will ask me okay sometime there were time like i will be just sitting on my bed and she will put the laptop in front of me and say <laughs> start working <laughs> yeah motivation yeah so yeah. Uh, and it's those are the hard times and yeah. and the thing is those times can still come correct you could have those times where suddenly something happens clients are not there mm-hmm. uh so yeah building that momentum is the challenging part uh i would say to overcome that you should distract yourself and take one step every day okay okay so for instance i said designing a logo correct that was a distraction yep but that also fulfilled something designing my website so i will be writing content every day uh yeah so those kind of the challenging parts. Okay. So you mentioned that you um you know work with cannabis and how would you say the transition was from working solely with food or the food industry to working in cannabis? How was the impact there? It was very challenging. Mm-hmm. Um and the, there are two fold reasons for it. First it's a brand new industry. Yes. Cannabis is absolutely new. Yeah. And I don't think people understand how new it is. At that time it was very new. Yeah. uh and the second thing is i've never worked in cannabis before when okay. i transitioned correct yeah. and the third thing is the company i worked with they have never worked in cannabis before they okay. were brand new too yeah so all of these elements added up to the anxiety at that point of time and i had very few resources to reach out because uh cannabis is highly regulated industry it's yeah. like uh i wouldn't say it's exactly same as pharmaceutical but it's a little bit closer to that yeah but what 
what was the issue is you wouldn't even know the information out was accurate or not except the regulations and the regulations were super con confusing at that time yeah so how what it helped me so these were the challenges first of all yeah what i did to overcome those challenges i i read a lot i okay. read every piece of information available on internet i will i will be like i got crazy mad and like i'm going to keep yeah. reading keep reading keep reading i will tie it to the regulations and if i don't find any information i will go to the contact i remember reaching out to fertilizer department in usa which has nothing to do with canada yeah. and asking them how heavy metals are going to impact in this product and if i think about this this is not required this is all crazy thing uh -huh. but at that point of time i didn't know right correct but based on that i know certain things i know exactly which document has which contact which section talks about what you yeah. know so that kind of helps um so that was the transition um and also the transition was from a tech job is yeah. to a, or a processing job to a manager directly okay so now i was directly becoming a manager obviously for a startup environment yeah. but still uh now you're managing first developing everything then you have to manage uh so that's how the transition was it was challenging but it it worked out and the what was the validation is when we passed our health canada audit amazing yeah so that was yeah. the validation okay correct otherwise there was no validation whatever you're doing and that was a, about a period of 1 to 2 years before uh, we got our audit done mm -hmm. and the audit was good and everything we still had some challenges afterwards unforeseen challenges mm -hmm. uh but uh, i would say overall journey was really good i had a very good relation with my uh team at that point of time who were founders and everyone and uh, good people i loved working with them so some of the skills i learned from this challenging journey was uh first not to lose your motivation that was the biggest factor because every day when you don't have a goal it was hard to know it's going to work out or not right. okay second thing is uh reach out to your contacts make good network uh, uh, i did a lot of networking at that time and i was not good at networking i thought i would <laughs> never be good at networking okay but i realized that networking was not very difficult mm -hmm. okay because uh, it was easier you reach out to people they will answer your question uh, what i also learned is the your detailed aptitude nature okay i would read a lot and what that reading does is now if i have to find any mistakes i don't have to read a whole document yeah okay so that helps out so these are few of the skills i learned um and that helped me out really well during that transition period okay and the transition period must have been tough but of course there's other impacts overall so what would you say was the overall impact positive or negative of the cannabis industry entering and then of course the impacts on your business i would say it's mixed bag okay? okay i wouldn't i would be lying if i say that it was all floppy journey because right now cannabis industry is a little bit challenging mm -hmm. a lot of people having tough times to make money and it's because of all government regulations and everything which i don't want to get into much but yeah. um but what it has impacted me is it has prepared me down the line okay okay because uh when we talk about industries we are not just focus on domestic cannabis we are also focused on us cannabis market which is opening up mm -hmm. we also have european cannabis market um and which is also a very bigger piece of pie and then we have cannabis in israel and everything okay so my i don't like the idea of being skill, my skill set just being on the domestic side of it so i'm doing some work on the export side of it okay with one of the client where we can export the product to uh, uh one of the export market and my intention is actually to do much more export side of it rather than domestic okay. uh, because you get more exposure and it's it's a little bit more challenging and interesting for me to uh learn overall the impact it has made on my life i would say it has prepared me better than another industry which i would have worked for okay okay so i think it's it makes it a little bit more resilient okay it also improves your communication power to your clients mm -hmm. because you are not dealing with multi million dollar clients yeah you're dealing with clients who has money problem mm -hmm. who really want to have the get the buck out of their money yeah if you can retain those clients so that tells you you're doing good yeah. correct yeah, <laughs> so of course you can go around multi million dollar clients but that tells you 
you're doing good. So it's easier for you moving yeah. forward. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And I guess it'll give you exposure to international markets, as you said. So the export piece of it, that's that's huge. Yeah. So you are a busy individual, of course, with your own consulting company and, of course, teaching at Conestoga College. How would you say you manage um, work life, work life balance? Um, I have stopped thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> just just go. <laughs> yeah. And the reason is if I if I think a lot about it. Yeah. Then, you know, all those crucial thoughts come to your mind. Am I spending too much time working and all that? And as soon as I've stopped thinking about work-life balance, my work-life balance has improved, honestly. Okay. Okay, because I'm not thinking about all the time. Right. If I have too busy of a day, if I think I cannot complete everything in a week, I spend some time on Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Okay. And that relieves the pressure for the whole week. Because knowing that I don't have to have the whole Saturday for myself enjoying, if I put few hours, that releases my pressure for the week and it works out. Mm-hmm. So that's how I'm managing and obviously not taking tons of courses to teach. Right. That helps. Right. So right now I'm only teaching one. Okay. And I will move to two when I think I have a capacity. Otherwise, maybe I will leave it to one. Yeah. So knowing what your limits are, knowing what your boundaries are and not, I guess, overfilling your agenda or your schedule, I think is what you're saying for work-life balance. You could overfill your agenda as long as you are you are okay to spend some of your family time. Okay. So it's yeah. knowing your priorities. Like there are, so for instance, if you are an individual who will say, I will not work on Saturday, Sunday, no matter what, then don't overfill your agenda. Right. But if you say, okay, no, I can take two extra client, one extra client, I will, but I'm okay to work a little bit on Saturday because I see growth, then yes, overfill your agenda. Absolutely. Um, so you have a, a press imp- very impressive career. Can you tell me about what was a pivotal moment for you? Was it when you transitioned from Ontario, from Saskatchewan to Ontario, when you came from India to Canada? Tell me, what was a pivotal moment in your career? Yeah, I would say coming from Saskatchewan to Ontario is the pivotal moment. I would say. Okay. Uh, because when we were in Saskatchewan, we had a lot of thoughts. Where shall we go? Right. Where shall we go next? Correct. Right. Whether I was even thinking moving back to India, maybe start my own thing there. Uh, Mm -hmm. And you always have those thoughts being an immigrant. Of course. Um, So that would be the pivotal moment. Um, Even the pivotal moment would be, I would say, is getting the job, what I got in Ontario. Yeah. Experiencing that, because that was a very challenging time, how things turned out. Uh, That was the time we also got our house. So there was a mortgage, there was everything. We were going through the high prices of houses and all that of kind course. of thing. Yeah. So I think there were a lot of pressure points which I never experienced before. Okay. And those challenging times helped us actually uh, kind of move forward. So th- that would be the one thing I would say. Okay. So the, the transition from Ontario to Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, yeah. No, from Saskatchewan to Ontario. <laughs> That's okay. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. No problem. Um, forgive me a little bit. All right. So in terms of just technology and the world in which we live in, how has artificial intelligence had an impact on your particular industry? So I will talk specifically about then chat GPT in this case. Okay. Um, I, I, I do not think the impact is there yet but okay. the impact could be in future mm-hmm. um, and it's so hard for me to guess honestly because the thing is there might be a time when the client will go online and try to find some information right this happened to me one time recently i will and yes so i was telling something to a client and the client told me well this is what i type on chat gpt and i got the same answer mm. and uh, Though we had a minor variation in the answer. Yeah. It was a calculation he was trying to do. Okay. Not, not like a regulatory thing, but like a calculation. And I was wondering whether how accurate is that answer. And that just made me think. I still sent him my calculation because I just wanted to make sure that I gave him like a spreadsheet where he can put numbers and he get this value um, for which he was trying to determine. I think as we move forward, it's going to be a little bit threat for everyone. Of course. In my understanding. Of course. Yeah, specifically, it might not solve complex gray area things, okay? Like you, where you have to make a decision. Right. But it might solve certain redundant things which many people get charged for. Right. And it's it's ever evolving. So there's no way to know what the change is going to be. And it just keeps getting 
better and better and better. Yeah, it's a very initial stage. Yeah. It's like, it's like a tip of the iceberg right now. That's it. So, That's it. I mean, it's, it, it's so hard to predict at this moment, but what we have seen with chat GPT is revolutionary. Yeah. Correct? Like Absolutely. It's, it's certainly how many people are utilizing it. And uh, yeah, so I'm also very much into stock market. <laughs> Once the stock comes out, <laughs> I have to buy that. <laughs> Absolutely. That would be a good one. Definitely. Definitely. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the projects you're working on right now? Uh, I cannot give you exactly the detail of okay. the project, but one of the service we provide is called as fractional QAP services. Okay. So like, you know, you might see the fractional chief marketing officer, fractional chief financial officer. What does it mean is similarly, there's a fractional QAP, quality assurance person. Okay. So with Health Canada, uh, you have to release products. Let's say if I'm releasing any cannabis products in the market, the company is releasing products. They have to make sure that the product is signed by a QAP professional. Okay, they have evaluated everything in the product before a consumer is consuming it. Because there's also medical people, like someone, uh, it's a prescription through a doctor too, correct? Yep. So they want to make sure it's like a medicine also, like you are consuming something which is free of contaminants, heavy metals or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So one of the services I provide is making sure that as a part of this, that we are complying with certain section of regulations, uh, Cannabis Act and regulations, let's say. And I provide the services to few clients where I act as their QAP. Okay. Okay. So it's fractional QAP because I'm not their full-time employee. Okay. I'm providing this service to them and the one client, second client like that. And I, at the same time, they're not paying someone full-time. Mm -hmm. So they're saving money. on their time. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. That sounds great. Yeah. 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 What would you say um, are some of the skills that you use on a regular basis, you know, as being a self-employed individual? I'm assuming you have to wear many hats, you know, different positions and things like that. But what would you say are some of the skills that you use in that position? So one of the skill, I would say more than the technical skill, you have to be very organized. And mm -hmm. uh, how was I started in my career? I was very unorganized. Uh -oh. okay? okay. Unorganized in the sense uh, my desk will be unorganized. I will have so much okay. of paperwork and everything. So I'm more organized now in my mind and in my laptop and my computer. Okay. So my documents and everything is very organized. Okay. My desk might not be still. <laughs> okay. So organization is the biggest thing. Time management. You need to know what is critical versus what is major versus what is minor. I mean, if you don't do this task today, is it going to have an impact in our timeliness? Mm -hmm. So you need to know your project management skills. Prioritize the urgent task first, those kind of things. Um, the other skill I would say is, obviously your communication skills are very important. I always, if I have my clients, no matter how many, whatever number of clients I have, what I do is I make sure that I communicate with them very effectively. Okay. And I do not ignore my clients. And that's what I think they like it because I'm a service individual guy. If I call someone on phone, I need a service. Yeah. Similarly, they expect that they call me, maybe not exactly at that moment, call them next day, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So those are the things which helps me. That put their fear down. So they're not take calling me. They know that Ashish will take care of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, that gives me time to complete the task based on my priority. Okay. So I would say prioritization. Yep. Um, time management, obviously, and communication. These are the skills uh, and organization, obviously. These are mm -hmm. the skills which helps. Mm -hmm. No, and those all make sense. And they're all key transferable skills that I think you can use in any job. Exactly. You know, you have to be able to effectively communicate. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. And uh, if I have to highlight, organization is so important. Uh, and there was one of the time, actually, I always thought I was very bad at organization, mm -hmm. obviously. But I didn't realize that how good I was until one of my clients, co-founder, told me, you are very good at organization. Okay. And I was surprised. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> I said, are you sure? <laughs> you're talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> she said, yes. I've seen so many people, but you're very good at organization. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe I realized, yes, you're, okay, you might be underestimating yourself, but you <laughs> might have got to that level now. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and if you could go back, taking it back, what advice would you give to the younger Ashish? Maybe before you embarked on this journey to Canada, what advice would you give to yourself? I would, uh, I would really tell them, um, I don't know, it's hard. Uh, because I, as I said, I don't have a 
fix passion kind of thing. Right. But what I will tell them is, uh, take your time. Don't rush in anything. Mm-hmm. Don't try to follow what other people are doing. Yep. And uh, whatever you try to do, try to learn a skill well in advance. Okay. Okay. If before even you have a degree or you're thinking about a degree, like a college diploma, whatever it is, yes. and it's good to have those and you're going to have, but start working on a skill. Right. So take those some certifications. Yeah. Take some certifications beforehand and start working on it. And now you have so many platforms like Coursera and Udemy. Yep. Start taking those certifications. What do you want to do? And and it's okay if it doesn't turn out what you wanted to do. But at least what it will help you is it will help you in choosing your main course. Yeah. So you will realize that and try to avoid something you hate. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And the funny thing is many times students don't know that they hate it until they get into it. Exactly. Then they realize they don't like it. So, yeah. So, and it's, it's always, you can take some of those credit courses, one or two courses, yeah. figure it out. What do you want to do? Yeah. So that's what I would uh, tell myself. Maybe if I go back, if I can. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming in today, Ashish. That thank concludes you. our meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. It was nice meeting you. What an inspiring conversation. Thank you for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Careers. If you like this episode and want to hear more, follow us on Spotify and subscribe to us on YouTube. See you in the next one.